if you're a woodworker and you've got a workshop, you've probably asked yourself the question, where do I put all this stuff? Yeah, it's a problem. And the longer you're at it, and the more stuff you've got, and the more projects you do, the bigger the problem becomes. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. I've got the biggest workshop I've ever had in my life, but I also have more tools. And I'm also doing more projects. So the bigger workshop is negated by more stuff. So how do you work this out? Now, I can't tell you how to design your workshop. I really can't, because I'm not you. I don't have your space to work with. I don't have your tools to work with. I probably don't do the same projects you do. You see, those are all factors in how we design our, our workshop. You know, if you just do small stuff, you don't need large areas. You don't need a large workbench. If you've got a lot of power tools, that says one thing. If you work mostly with hand tools, that says another thing. So the types of projects you do, the, um, the types of tools you've got, and the space you have to work with, all are factors in how you design your workshop. So what I want to do is I want to give you some keys into figuring it out for yourself. And some of the things I'm going to say, I'll tell you right now, are going to go against what other people say because I think there's some false information out there. Other things I'm going to say may agree with them. But what I want to do is, is help you figure out how you're going to get the most out of the space you have available so you can have a workshop that not only do you enjoy working in, but you can do the work you want to do in. So let's take a look at how to design a workshop. I'm going to give you the tips you need for doing so. Okay? First of all, before you do anything, don't start moving stuff around. Don't start putting stuff in places until you do a drawing. Get yourself some graph paper and draw out your workshop to scale. That's why I said graph paper. You know, one quarter of an inch equals a foot or one centimeter equals a foot. And, and make it to size, the workshop you've got, the space you've got available there. Make sure you mark on there where all your windows and doors are. If you've got a, a furnace or a hot water heater, make sure you include that. Everything that's going to affect the use of that space. So generally speaking, one quarter inch or one centimeter equals a foot, and that works out really well. And then make yourself little cardboard cutouts or paper cutouts using the graph paper again of all your different tools, your major tools, your workbenches, everything that takes up large amounts of space and make them to scale again so you can move them around on that paper and see how they're going to fit. You know, it's a whole lot easier to work on that piece of paper and juggle things around on that piece of paper than it is to try and do it with the real stuff. And let me say right now, it's easier to do it on paper than it is to do it on the computer. I've done both. Yes, you can design in a computer and I know modern architecture, everything is designed in the computer. But it's actually easier to move those little pieces of paper around, your little models, to get things where you want. And then if you want to draw it on the computer, go right ahead. I would probably do that just so I have a permanent record, you know, and then I have something I could actually take out to the workshop without all the pieces moving. But, but start out on paper because that's what you need. All right? So once you've got that, now you can go start putting things in place. Now, let me say this right now. Designing a workshop is not a one-time thing. Any workshop is a work in progress. You're always going to be adding to it. Just today, I moved some things around in my workshop because I said, I don't like where that is. And for three months now, I've been figuring, trying to figure out where I should put it and I, so I could have it close to my workbench. And I finally found a spot that really wasn't be, being utilized efficiently. I took what was there and put it away because I hardly ever use it. And I, I put it there. And what I'm talking about is hand sanders. Now, we all use hand sanders all the time, and my hand sanders were on another workbench, but I use them on this workbench. Well, now they're on the workbench that's in between, which is right next to this one, so at least they're close. I don't have to go as far to get them. How far you've got to go to get something is a big deal. So one of the big considerations when you're trying to figure out your workshop space and how you lay things out is how far do you have to go from where I'm working to where I need or to where, to where I get what I need. And we'll be talking about that in a couple different points here, okay? So let's start out with, with the first point. And the first point I want to bring up is disputing what a lot of other people say. A lot of people say design your workshop for material flow. And what they mean is your material comes in the door, it gets cut, it gets shaped, it, 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 it probably gets cut and then it gets uh, jointed and plain and then it gets onto the table saw and then, then it gets any other further shaping operations like maybe cutting curves or whatever, cutting, cutting miters, whatever you might have to do, and then it gets assembled, and then it gets finished. And so, I, theoretically, you have a bunch of stations where you do each of these things in a row. 
All right, that's great if you're setting up a manufacturing facility. Hey, I was a manufacturing engineer for 15 years before I moved on to other things. I know about workflow, okay? And if you're setting up a manufacturing operation where you're going to be doing a lot of something, yeah, that's important. If you're setting up your workshop and you're going to build cutting boards and you want to build, you know, 500 cutting boards a month, you better think about workflow. Better think about material flow. Those are important issues. If you're a home hobbyist, if you're using your workshop to do projects for your house, maybe small pieces of furniture, knickknacks, doodads, whatever, you don't need to worry so much about material flow. What you need to worry about is how convenient is it for you to work. Now that's a, a, a different subject. Now what I work, set my workshop shop up with, and this is what I recommend, is have work centers rather than material flow. What do, I, what do I mean by work centers? Well, I have my table saw and my radial arm saw sitting side by side over here. Okay, you can't see them right now. Uh, but here's a picture, okay? And the reason I have them together is a lot of times I use them together. I may have boards of whatever type and I need to thin them. Uh, so I'll rip them on the table saw and then I take them to the radial arm saw to cut them to length. And then I might have to go back to the table saw. So the two saws being together make it a whole lot easier for me to do that operation. That, or those operations, I should say. Not only that, but the table saw acts as a staging area for the wood on the radial arm saw, and the radial arm saw acts as a staging area for the wood I'm cutting on the table saw. So the two work out very well together. So that's a cutting work center. Now, my bandsaw isn't part of that cutting work center, but the bandsaw is for different types of cutting. That's not where you're, you're doing your cutting of your material. That's where you're doing shaping of material. It's a different animal. I'm more likely to use that in conjunction with my, my router my router table, okay? So I've got them together. I have another work center over here where I've got my planer and my joiner. Now, I gotta be honest, my joiner is not working. It's an antique joiner that I'm in the process of restoring and the process is going slow because I don't have much time for it. But they're together. And why are they together? Well, they're together because a lot of times you work, use them together. You'll, you'll joint the one surface, okay, to get it flat and then you'll run it through the planer to get the other side parallel to it. And then you might go back to the joiner to get your edge perpendicular to the, the, the flat surface. And so the two are often used together. Now here's another little trick that you can do with that, okay? When I built the cart that my, my planer is sitting on, I built it higher than my workbench. It's about four inches higher than my workbench. My joiner is about two inches higher than my workbench. Now what that allows me to do is literally that the material paths can cross each other. Okay. The other thing it allows me to do is I can take either of them, line them up with my workbench, and allow my workbench to be an outfeed table, because both of those are on wheels. Okay. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Now I have another work center over here, and this this work center consists of my sanders. I've got a belt sander and an oscillating spindle sander, and a lot of times I find I use the two of those together. And I also have my scroll saw over there. Now, just about anything I cut on the scroll saw, and I'm not a scroller, so I'm not doing design work as much as I'm cutting out parts on it, I have to take to one of those two sanders. And often if I'm using one sander, I probably have to use the other sander. You, know, you can do ex external curves on the belt sander, but you can't do internal curves on the belt sander. You can do internal curves on the oscillating spindle sander, but it's kind of hard to do a good job on external curves or flats on the oscillating spindle sander. So I've got uh, a workbench against the wall over there that has those two sanders and the scroll saw all together, nice and convenient so I can use them together. Okay, so that's what I mean by work centers. Everything that I'm gonna do in conjunction with one particular type of work, I try and put close together. That saves me moving around, but I also try and put some sort of a staging area, whether it's this workbench or like I talked about with my table saw and my radial arm saw, uh, my, my jointer and planer, I have my uh, Craig Adaptive Cutting System, which has got its own table that I can use for a staging area for those. The, the sanders, that's on a workbench, there's some free space, well, I try and keep some free space on there so I can stage stuff over there. So everything's got staging areas. Staging area is important because you always have material coming in and material coming going out. Now you may only have one piece but if you have more than one piece, you gotta have someplace to set it down before you work on it, and then someplace to set it down after you work on it. And those two have to be separated enough that you don't mix the pieces up. So you need staging area, okay? So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about work centers. 
Well, you need good work centers. And, and it doesn't matter how, how far apart they are as much as that they are established as work centers and everything that you use together is close, you know, within a step or two of each other so that you don't have to go running all over the place. As part of this workflow idea, make sure you've got good aisleways. You know, I'm standing behind my workbench, but this is an aisleway. I basically have two main aisleways here in my workshop. I've got this one, and then I've got one that goes perpendicular to it over there in front of the back wall, that workbench where I mentioned I've got my sanders. Then on that side of the workshop where I've got the, the two work centers with my cutting and my, my planing and joining, I have a third aisle. And I always keep those three aisles open. I can just about run laps in here, okay? They'd be short laps, but I can run laps in here. Why do I do that? Because I don't want to hassle getting from one part of my workshop to another. Now, getting me from one part to the other is more important getting, than getting material from one part to the other. Because if I can't get me, I'm not going to get the material. So, as part of setting up your work centers, think about how do I get from one area of my workshop to another. Never block yourself off. Never make a situation where you've got to move something out of the way to be able to get through. Next thing I want to mention is to design your workshop around the items that you use the most. Your biggies. What do I mean by your biggies? Generally speaking, we're talking about the workbench and the table saw. Now those are usually the physically biggest items as well, but we're not talking about the size as much as we are how much time you spend working there. Think about your own work or about anybody you've seen on YouTube. They spend a lot of time at those two places, either at their workbench or at their table saw. Okay, so those are the things that you want not only the best access to, but probably you want them centrally located, okay? And when I mean centrally located, let's say you're working with a garage, you've got a, a 20 foot by 20 foot garage, those probably won't be against the wall. Now, I know some people put their workbenches against the wall. I've got nothing against that if that works for you. I have mine in the middle of the floor, not so much because I'm shooting video here, but because that gives me the ability to work from both sides. If I'm working on a big project, like say building a door, I probably need to get to both sides. Or if I'm working on something and say I've got something glued up over here on this side of the workbench, the side I normally work on, I can still go to the other side of the workbench and work. So that's why I've got mine out in the middle of the room. A lot of people put their workbench up against the wall and that works out for them. One nice thing about that, especially if your workbench isn't too deep, is that you can put your tools up on the wall. You can have a tool wall there and have all your tools readily accessible, or at least the ones you use the most. So there's some, some benefit in that. Another thing a lot of people do is, is that they'll, they'll either, if they've got, say, a contractor saw, mount their contractor saw into a workbench and make the two one. Or maybe if they have a larger floor model saw, they'll have their workbench also serve as the outfeed table for their table saw and make them the same height so that they made up perfectly so the material coming off the table saw can go onto the, uh, the workbench. So that those are things to consider in that. The idea though is, is you want ready access to those pieces. Now some other things like say, let me pick on the bandsaw again, you may not use very often, okay? Well, then that doesn't need to be out in the middle. That can be somewhere against a wall and it can be moved out if you need it, and moved back or whatever, okay? So that's, that doesn't need the preeminence of the things you use all the time. So that's why I was talking about the, 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 the workbench and the table saw as being things you want to put where you have good access to them, preferably from all sides. Now, speaking of workbenches, one of the things anybody needs is a lot of workbench space. I've seen an awful lot of workshops with small workbenches, and if you only work on small things, that'll probably work out for you. But I have three workbenches in this workshop, and uh, this one's pretty big. This is a little over three feet by eight feet, okay? Like I said, I can build a door on it, and that was part of what I was designing it to be able to do. It's a large work area. This is my main work area. Now, there's some things piled on both ends. There always seems to be stuff piled on both ends, but my main open work area is a good six feet long, by three feet wide. I also have, almost butted up to it, not quite, there's a little bit of space between them, another workbench that's, uh, I'd say about two and a half feet by maybe three and a half or four feet. And it's, it's also on wheels. By the way, both these workbenches are movable. This is movable as well. It's 460 pounds, but it's got those lever lock type of casters that I can pop them down and I can move it if I need to, okay? And I do need to move it every once in a while. 
That one is also on wheels. And, and that was actually the workbench I had in my last workshop because that's all the room I had. I didn't have room for this big workshop, workbench. Okay, I still use it. Sometimes it just ends up piled up with stuff, but mostly I use it for like repairing tools or if I'm doing some work on my car or something where I really don't want to put it on this workbench, that's what that workbench is for. It also usually has a bunch of small projects in process. All right, right now there's some, some pieces of jewelry in process on it and uh, there's, there's a, a, a vase I just recently turned on the lathe and I'm still working on, on waxing and it's sitting on there right now, stuff like that. There's always some little stuff sitting on that workbench. But I still have a good open area that I can, if I've got to take apart a drill or a saw to fix it, I've got a place to work. My third workbench is the one I mentioned that's against the wall and it's 16 feet long by 2 feet deep. It's permanently mounted, and it's actually, it actually doesn't have back legs. It's bolted to the wall, okay? And the purpose of that one is to give me some place for those bench-mounted tools that I already mentioned. But it's also the place I use when I come back from the hardware store and I've got stuff in my hand and I need to put it down somewhere. That's where it goes, not here. You know what? You know, we always end up with stuff, you know? We, we, we're at the hardware store. We're picking up something we need, and we remember, yeah, I got this project coming up. I better pick up this for it. All right, so we pick up that. Now what do you do with that thing you've picked up? I don't want that stuff on this workbench because I need the workspace on this workbench. I use that workbench against the wall for that, and I'll be honest, it generally gets pretty darn cluttered. Okay, uh, Right now it's got a number of tools on it, sitting in boxes on it that I'm in the midst of evaluating, and they're just, they're just taking up space. But at least it's not taking up space on my make, main workbench. Seems to me you've always got stuff that you've got to put somewhere. And that's what that workbench does for me. By having that, no matter how cluttered it gets, it helps me keep this one free. So there's a real value in having lots of workbench space. If you do a lot of projects, especially if you have overlap in your projects while you're working on one and, and you hit a stopping point so you work on another one, maybe you've glued something up here or maybe you put some finish on it or whatever and you've just got to let it sit and you go work on another one, you probably need more than one workbench or you need a large workbench, okay? So I highly recommend thinking about work, workbench space. I see, like I said, a lot of workshops that have one little workbench that's maybe five feet long and two deep, feet deep. And if that's all you've got room for and that's all you can afford, go for it. But if you can give yourself more workbench space, even if that means doing more of it later, then do so. In addition to the workbenches I've got here, I've got out in a shed that I call my annex, I have two more workbenches. One of them's got my laser engraver mounted on it permanently so that I don't have to put that on this workbench. And the other one is just a finishing table. That's all I use it for. I get so much sawdust in here that I try and avoid finishing in here, especially varnishing. So things I'm going to varnish, I'll take out there and I'll do it out there, leaving this workbench free and leaving me free to work in here because you know how it is. If you put varnish on something, you shut the workbench down till the, or the workshop down till the next day. So, yeah, give yourself lots of workbench space. Oh, you can't afford to do it now? That's all right. Just plan the space, leave that space, and know that that's what you're going to do. Okay, so we've got our major items, our workbench and our table saw located. We found a home for them. Well, what about your other big stuff, your other uh, big tools, power tools, floor mount tools, or even bench mount tools that maybe you've decided to mount on a cart of some sort or a small stand of some sort? Uh, where do you put those? Now, one of the best things you can do with those is put them on wheels. And a lot of people will recommend this. This is not an original idea with me. Here in my workshop, of course, my table saw, which is a contractor saw, but a large contractor saw, has wheels. My Craig Adaptive Cutting System is designed to be moved, so it's got wheels. The stand I made for my uh, planer is on wheels. My router table that I just recently made is on wheels. But on the other hand, my, my drill press isn't on wheels, and nor is my bandsaw, although the bandsaw is light enough that I can actually physically just manhandle it and move it around without a whole lot of problem. Why do you want it on wheels? Well, because that, that space in the middle of your workshop is at a premium. We've already taken up a lot of it with workbench and with table saw, but we don't want to have all the rest of our tools sitting there. We probably want to park them when they're not being used against the wall. So put them on wheels, okay? Make, make yourself carts, make yourself stands uh, that put them on wheels, and you can put them against the wall when you're not using them, and then when you need them, you can bring them out. 
Now, you want either locking casters or ideally the drop-down casters. Like I mentioned, I've got on my, uh, my big workbench here, the kind that you, you, you step on it and that brings the wheel up or brings the height of the whole item up so that the wheel is under it. Move it to where you want and then drop it in place. You really don't want to be using most power tools with the wheels unlocked, with the wheels able to move because it'll move and it'll probably help make you mess up whatever it is you're trying to do, okay? Uh, the, only, the only tools I have any concern about that with here in my shop is my, my router table and, and the, the stand for my planer. Now the planer, that's not a big deal so much, but with the router, yeah, I've messed up some stuff. And so uh, I, I have replaced the casters on it, what was originally under it, with locking casters so that it can, I can park it somewhere, all right? Wheels are, are your friend. Make it so you can put the, the tools away and bring them out. And then things like, like, like a router table. Now my router table is, is 32 inches wide here, okay? That's a fair amount of space against the wall. And uh, I could have made it less and put drop down sides on it, okay? That's one thing that some people do. That's worth doing it, especially with tools that you may not use quite as often. If you need that space, let's say I was going to do something for my drill press and I needed a work table that I could set things on, okay? I might make a, a drop-down table that's hanging off this side of the, uh, in some way that I could put stuff on, okay? Or, or even for my, my bandsaw. That's useful to be able to do that. That way it's not taking up so much room when it's against the wall, but when you get it out and you're trying to use it, you've got that staging area I was talking about. Those staging areas are val valuable, okay? So wheels are really useful. Now, if you're going to put wheels on things, you may as well make a cabinet and make, give yourself some storage. If there's one thing you never have enough of in any workshop besides space, it's storage. You want to maximize the storage you have available. Now, my, my second workbench, the, my old workbench, has all, all cabinets underneath, and that's all filled with power tools. When I built the stand for my planer, I built a cabinet under it, and it doesn't have doors, it doesn't close, but I, it's enclosed, and it's got shelves there, and I've got power tools stored there. I've got extension cords stored on a shelf uh, underneath my bandsaw, and I've got some other tools stored uh, on shelves underneath my drill press. So I'm, I'm trying to maximize the use of all these spaces that I've got to, so that I can store as much as possible, all right? You, the last thing you want is to waste any storage space. You're, you'll, you will find that you'll always need more. With as much space as I've got in here, as much storage as I've got in here, I am fighting a constant battle of finding places to put things where they're out of the way. So I try and use whatever space I can like that. Uh, this workbench, when I build it, I build a shelf under it, and that's mostly where I've got jigs and fixtures, both above the shelf and underneath the shelf. I've got mostly jigs and fixtures under here. Uh, the workbench against the wall, uh, one end of it has got my two generators under it, so there's not room really for a shelf there, but the other side's got a shelf splitting it, and I've got all kinds of stuff stored under there. Not so much power tools, but other things, boxes of parts, things like that. I've got, uh, speaking of parts boxes, I've got parts boxes on a shelf above that workbench, giving me room for, you know, all the myriad of little parts that you end up collecting. Uh, left over from one project or another or because you keep them on hand because you use them all the time like screws and things like that. So maximize your storage space anywhere you can build storage space. Now I've seen some really creative use of storage space in different workshops where people built uh, cabinets to store things, they built uh, a cabinet you can put in these multi-compartment boxes for small parts and they've got as many small parts as a hardware store uh, all neatly organized. And they're use, only using a footprint of maybe a, a foot square. And they've made good use of that space. That's something we all need to do, is find better ways of making use of the space that we have available, storing things well. Okay? And as part of that, I highly recommend putting your wall space to use. Now, there's very little wall space available in this workshop. This wall back here is really the only wall we could say is available space. But you really can't see it from the camera but there's a, a handicap ramp here uh, behind my power tools here. So I'm losing actually a little over three feet of space on this side of my workshop to that handicap ramp. It was here when we bought the house, and because my wife and I are getting a little bit older, we decided to leave it in place.
but that means instead of my workshop being 22 feet wide, it's actually 18 and a half feet wide. Okay, you, you make trade-offs like that. So th this wall is kind of wasted space, and that's why I've got these old tools hanging there. That's just uh, my, my own little collection, uh, very little collection of antique tools, and it's there more just because I like them. Okay, I really can't use that wall space for other things, but that wall's got stuff on it. The garage door's got stuff hanging on it. This wall has some shelves, and over here it's got uh, a tool holder hanging on it. It's got shelves that have got wood on them. Uh, this wall, of course, has that long workbench, and above it, it's got all those parts cabinets, and above that, it's got wood on racks up there, uh, my clamp racks over here. Pretty much all the wall space is being used, okay? Make the most of your wall space. If you've got tools that are going to be parked against the wall, uh, then take the space above them and, and put shelves there. Put storage for wood there. Put storage for other things up there. Whatever. Don't let that space go to waste. Some people will even hang things off their ceiling. I don't have a lot hanging off my ceiling, at least as far as that, because if I look around on my ceiling, I see lights, I see cables, I see wires, I see an air filtration system, I see cameras. There's all kinds of stuff up there. I really don't have room to use it for storage. But I've seen people put racks up there to put lumber up there uh, on the inside of their, their roof. Okay, so you lose a foot of space. There aren't too many of us that are seven feet tall anyway. So make good use of that wall space. Walls are a great place to store things. It gets them out of the way. It, it's easily visible, and, uh, and it's a good way to keep track of things. Now, one of the best things you can put on your walls is your lumber. Okay, I have a, a lumber rack here where I keep lumber vertical, and this is mostly pine one buys, but there's also some walden in there. There's some oak in there, there's some poplar in there, and there's one piece of purple heart in there. And I think that's probably it. I mean, I've got a, a, all kinds of stuff in there. I've got another little place that's similar to it over there where I've got material stacked vertically, and it's got, it looks like there's some walnut there, some pine there, and some, some basswood there. And, uh, and then I've got some, some like the, the angled wall brackets on the wall over here and over here. That one's got maple and walnut on it, and that one's got pine on it. So I, I make use of that wall space for storing not only wood, but again, like I said, parts cabinets, tools, whatever you can. Next thing I'd like to recommend to you is put your hand tools where you're going to use them. Now, there's two schools of thought on, on hand tools. One is to put them in a toolbox, and I've got a couple of large toolboxes here and a couple roll arounds, and I've got a, they're full, okay? But mostly they're full of other things, not woodworking tools. They're th full of mechanics tools. They're full of engineering tools. Uh, there are some woodworking things, like I've got one drawer in this, uh, this one uh, roll around that is uh, just uh, spring clamps and uh, C-clamps, okay? I've got another drawer that is just abrasives. Uh, so, so yeah, there's some things like that, but mostly those are for non-woodworking tools. The woodworking tools, the tools that I use all the time, I try and find places to put them where they're convenient to me. For example, I've got my chisels in a stand right here. Actually, what I did is I took the box they came in and I made a stand for the box so that they're sitting right here on the edge of my bench because chisels are one of those things you use all the time. I just recently did a project where I made a, a small tool board, like a, it's, it's kind of like a miniature tool wall, about two by two and a half feet, that's mounted to this end of my bench, and that's where I got all my measurement tools mounted, because that's something I'm always reaching for, is measurement tools. So instead of having to dig them out of a drawer in the, in the toolbox, where they used to be, now they're right there and I can grab them easily, and it makes them much easier to work with. But I've also got things like uh, saws. My saws are, are mounted, the ones I use all the time anyway, are mounted to the side of this roll-around toolbox with magnets. Makes them quick and easy to grab and quick and easy to put back. Above that is screwdrivers. The next toolbox over has a rack that's got hammers on it. Um, I've got my, my, my uh, drills and uh, uh, impact driver on a rack that's underneath the lip of the other workbench so it's really just right at the end of this workbench okay so I do a lot of things like that where I'm trying to find places to put tools close by uh, like I said at the intro I've got three sanders that I just mounted to this other workbench to put them closer to this bench they used to be on the mount, sitting on the workbench against the wall which was too far away now that instead of that far it's only two steps away from from this workbench okay 
and I, I do a lot of things like that. You can waste a lot of time looking for stuff. Now back when I was a manufacturing engineer, I ran a st study where I compared work areas. And what I did is, is I, I compared the work areas that were really neat and the work areas that weren't really neat, okay? You know, you got some people that er there's a place for everything and everything is always in its place. And you got other people that there's a place for everything and everything's all over the place. And I compared their work habits and I compared their productivity. Now that was part of what I did is, as a manufacturing engineer, productivity was a big thing, okay? And I found that a neat work area where everything is where it's supposed to be will allow you to get 30% more done. That's three zero. Yeah, it's like you can get a project and a half done in the time that you would otherwise get a project done. That's the difference. It's a huge difference. And so we instituted things in the factory where we literally had foam cutouts in the toolboxes for tools to go into. And actually, this is a thing that's commonplace nowadays in factories, but back then it wasn't. Okay? I had a real fight with upper management to spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars on buying new toolboxes and getting these foam inserts made for everybody's tools, but it paid off. Now, maybe that's too much work for you, but you know, it really wasn't that much work for me to make this tool board here where I've got my measurement equipment. And there's, we've got a video up if you'd like to see how I did that. It really wasn't that hard to do. And you could do that, maybe not for measuring equipment, maybe for something else. Whatever it is that you need at hand, that's the key. Have the stuff you need readily at hand, okay? And, and have it where you can get to it quickly. You know, I mentioned I've got fixtures underneath my workbench. You know, here's a bench hook right here. I don't even have to look. I know where, right, right where it is. So if I need to use that bench hook to cut something, it's right there. I've got a bench stop right here, and it's in its own bracket. And if I needed to get this out and put it in my base, it's right there. It, this stuff's all readily at hand, and that's the point. Is everything readily at hand? No. My clamps are in a rack over there on the wall. I don't have any place here close where it makes sense to put them. I could hang them up here, and I'd run my head into them. I could hang them over the workbench, and you wouldn't be able to see me. Okay? So there's limits to what you can do, but as much as possible, and especially for the things that you use all the time, put them close to you. I've got three last things I want to mention here that aren't so much in how you set up your workshop or organize your workshop, but they're still really important things that are going to make a lot of difference in getting the most out of your workshop, okay? The first one is anti-fatigue mats. These are those foam mats that you find used in factories and stuff like that for people who stand on cement all the time working, yeah, like us in our workshops. You can buy a package of four of these, and these are about two feet square. They're interlocking. You can get them at Harbor Freight, a package of four for about $20. And I'll tell you what, they make life a whole lot easier. Uh, I've got a little bit of arthritis in my knees, and, and standing on these is a whole lot better than standing on the cement all day long. Good investment. I've got three packages of them in here. I've got them alongside this bench, the other workbenches, my lathe, my radio arm saw, and my table saw. All the places I'm usually standing. Not everywhere in the shop, but all the places I'm usually standing. It makes a lot of difference. $60 investment, I saved my knees. Well worth it, okay? The second thing I want to say is lighting. Now, when we bought this house, it had your typical two little light fixtures in the garage with 100 watt bulbs in them. And uh, I replaced those out for LED, whatever the, LED, the equivalent of that was. And I thought I was in pretty good shape. Well, then my kids gave me some of those screw-in light fixtures for garages that have got like three wings of LEDs on them. Yeah, wow, that made a huge difference. I had a lot of light in here. And then I started recording video and realized we still didn't have enough light in here. So now I've got these four-foot LED. They look like fluorescent light fixtures, but they're not. They're LED all over the place. And I got more light in here than I know what to do with. But you know, it's great because I can see what I'm working on that much better. And of course, you can see me as well, too. But even when I'm in here just by myself and I'm not recording, I'll still turn on the lights. Maybe I won't turn on all those lights because maybe I'm not working in that part of the workshop. Or maybe I'm not working in that part of the workshop. Okay, but I'm working right here at the bench. I'll put on the ones that cover the bench. And I've got great lighting here on the workbench. Really makes it easier to see what I'm working on, especially the details. So I highly recommend getting yourself a lot of light. It really doesn't cost that much. 
Well, okay, maybe you can't do it all at once. Do it a little at a time. You know, I told you, I did it in stages. And uh, there's something like uh, a dozen of these fluorescent lights in here, plus the, the, the three wing things that are in the sockets. Got lots of lighting in here. And then the last item is lots of electrical outlets. Now, your typical garage is going to be wired for 120 volts, one circuit breaker. That's a, a uh, 20 amp circuit breaker. And you can probably do most of what you want to do on that one circuit breaker. But don't run two stationary power tools at a time. If you're going to run a stationary power tool with a dust collector, you're probably going to go over the limit. Okay? You really need at least two circuits into your workshop, two 20 amp circuits. If you're going to have any 220 volt equipment, of course, you got to run that separately. If you're going to have air conditioning, of course, you got to run that separately. I currently have three. Uh, 20 amp circuits in here. One of them is for my mini split air conditioner. One is for the majority of my power tools and one is for my lighting and dust collection. And that way I'm sure I'm not running near the, the edge, okay? You need a lot of outlets. Not only do I have that, but I've got outlets everywhere. Like this wall behind me, there's two outlets hidden behind these tools down here. I've got electrical outlet on the side of my workbench. I've got electric outlets on that workbench. I've got two six outlet strips on that workbench over there. Uh, I've got a six outlet strip on my, my lathe. I've got a six outlet strip over there. Uh, and, and those are each wired into two different um, uh, electrical outlets. And I've got an electrical outlet that we put in over here. And I've got an electric outlet on the corner of that workbench, which is there for dust collection. And I have, I have two plug strips attached to that workbench one for tools and one is just my lighting control center where I control all these fluorescent lights. So I can come in and decide which lights I need on and just hit those and turn them on. So I got, light, I got outlets everywhere so that I've got plenty of power no matter what I'm doing. And I don't have to worry about tripping breakers. Not only do I have to not worry about tripping breakers, I don't have to worry about the, the fire hazard. And that's really something to be concerned about if you're running a lot of power tools. So here you have it. This is my list of things that you need to do to set up your workshop and get the most out of it. Now, your workshop is probably not going to look at my, like mine, and mine's not going to look like yours. First of all, we do different things in our workshop. Secondly, we've got different tools. Okay, That's okay. It doesn't matter what your workshop looks like, at least as far as compared to anybody else's. What it matters is that it works for you. And if you come up with something that's totally different than anyone else's, but it works, that's great. Find what works for you, and, and don't be stuck on what you lay out. Go ahead and set it up, work with it for a few months, maybe six months, see how you like it, and in that time, I'll guarantee you, you'll come up with some ideas on how to improve it, okay? So then you go to the next iteration, you move a few things around, you know, maybe in the meantime, you'll, you'll have times when you'll say, you know, I really need some storage for this, I think I'll build that. Building a workshop, setting it up ideally the way you want it is an ongoing process. Don't expect to get it done in the first shot. I've been doing the woodworking for 50 years. I've had a number of different workshops. Every one of them has been totally different. And, and I've learned each time and taken those lessons and applied it to the new workshop to making the new workshop that much better. Do the same. In the meantime, make lots of sawdust, have fun, and uh, if you make something really great, let's see what it looks like, huh? Have a good one.